Joining me today is fellow podcaster Jeremy Mills. I actually got to go on Jeremy's podcast and describe my journey through basketball, and I felt like we had a really good connection. And the thing that I feel like is very evident about Jeremy is he's very selfless. He doesn't really talk about himself that much, and I, I really felt like I wanted to hear more about his journey and his story. It's an honor to have had him on. His vulnerability it was awesome throughout this podcast. Um, and he shares a lot of really personal stuff that I think you'll see his unconditional love for people and podcasting and sharing stories. And the reason why he does it is so pure um, that it inspires me. And, um, you know, like I said, just an honor to have had him on. And uh, I think you guys will really enjoy this conversation. Um, and stay tuned. I think we're going to collaborate more so in the future. So um, hope you guys enjoy and keep flowing. Being able to shoot and trying to stretch it out again to be able to, you know, snap it. Like, I'm not like, that it good like at all. You're an athletic driver, bro. <laughs> yeah. I am, though. That's all I can do. I got a good first step. You're not it's, shooting the threes? No. How's it feel on the other side right now? Good. <laughs> it's different. <laughs> I've only done it a few times. Oh, really? So uh-huh. you've done a couple other ones? Yeah. Cool. Over the phone, though, mainly. Or okay, Skype cool. or whatever. So Nice. This may be my first in-person other one. So Wow. Shouts Monumental. out to you. <laughs> Shouts out to my guy, Will. Oh, yeah. Appreciate the book, by the way, dude. I'm, yeah. I'm so excited to go back and read it some more. Yeah, it inspired me to want to go back and read it because it's been a minute. but Dude, it is yeah. like so simple, but... Mm-hmm. Like, like when you've done enough digging, it mm-hmm. sometimes it just takes that little click. Mm-hmm. You're like, wow, that was, mm-hmm. that's all I needed to hear. Exactly. But I loved it, dude. Just the simplicity. Exactly. There's a beauty <laughs> in just being. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and that's taken me forever to figure out, dude, mm-hmm. honestly. But it's been beautiful. I mean, to even figure it out ever is awesome. So That's true. I mm-hmm. mean, I think it gets to a point where you, you almost just have to figure it out or mm-hmm. else. Like, it, like you got to mm-hmm. figure out something. But all right, we'll get it going. Hello and welcome to the Flow Station. I'm your host, Will Ferris, and as always, the goal is to help you cultivate your unique flow by bringing on guests who have tapped into theirs. Got my man, Jeremy Mills, in the building today. Uh, We connected, what, uh, two days ago? Yeah, man, it's been quick. (laughs) It's a quick turnaround, but I got to go on his podcast, which was awesome. Uh, So hopefully you guys will be able to check that out. And then now he's he's on mine today, so I appreciate you coming on, man. Yeah, man, thanks for having me. Oh, yeah. Appreciate it. (laughs) Well, I mean, I know the the podcast that I went on for you. It was where I was talking a little bit too much about myself, but then you you no, were going in. Not at all. <laughs> You're a great guest. <laughs> I appreciate it, man. But you could tell you've been a host as the guest. <laughs> you know what I mean? How so? Not just taking everything for yourself, which in an interview that that, yeah. that is what I want. But it's nice to have somebody hit you back. It, as a for host, sure. it energizes you a little bit. It wakes you up. It kind of stimulates You're you. Like, keep oh, you going. I'm allowed to talk. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Let me, not, let me get off script here. Oh, yeah. Well, just a few of the insights you said during my interview, um, I, I wanted to hear more, more of. We got to talk a little bit after mm-hmm. um, about your journey a little bit into podcasting, but I would love to hear more detailed version of it, man. Mm-hmm. Like, it seems like you've had quite the journey to do what mm-hmm. you're doing, and uh, it seems like you love what you're doing. So yeah. um, what led you to, to want to do podcasting, and how did you get to Seattle? Yeah, so it kind of stemmed from – High school football, oddly enough. I was never that good. My <laughs> what friends, position were you? Uh, receiver. Okay. Receiver, safety. My friends were good, and I liked hanging out with them, so I would play. I was really into the Cowboys, but I would always get hurt because I was, you know, probably not training like I should have been. <laughs> you know, just kind of getting out there doing crazy stuff. So both ankle in- it was ankle injuries that happened, and I wanted to stay around the team. I was staying around my friends. The coach was hilarious. So I went to the radio station. No, I went to the uh, city paper and asked them if I could be a sports reporter. Just that simple, dumb, you know, don't know any better kind of, let me try this. Yeah. He's like, yeah, write me up something. And I did. He liked it. Boom. All of a sudden I'm writing for the paper, covering, you know, all the high school teams. And through that, a guy named Jay Sanderson at the radio station, you know, read that article. He's like, okay, this is awesome. I'm from out of town. I'm new here. I'm the sports director at the, you know, small town radio station. So when he invites me on his morning show, so, you know, I go on, never spoken into a microphone other than <laughs> at, at weddings, you know, doing the Stone Cold Steve Austin <laughs> stuff. But, uh, 
I go on there, you know, tell a little bit of how I got there even at that point, and I just kept coming back. Every morning, 7 a.m., the show started. I would go to school at, you know, 8 or 9, and that was just every day, every weekday. I kept coming back. That led into going to, you know, football games as a sideline reporter, which led into being in the box, being the color commentator, which led into color commentating volleyball, wrestling, all of which I had no experience for, <laughs> yeah. mind you. So it was just, it, it taught me to just go for it and, you know, take a chance and figure it out from there. Uh, Did you miss playing when you were on the sideline doing, or just the color commentary too, were you ever like man I wish I'd rather be out I'd rather be out there versus in the booth or did was it like a passion from the beginning it was a passion from the beginning and it was also something I was a lot better at like my okay. mind was definitely a lot farther than my body at that point now you know I'm walking everywhere I'll outrun you on the court you know <laughs> yeah. I'll probably miss my handle and all that won't make the layup but uh, the point is just I wasn't as athletic back then gotcha. but my mind was just so involved with football cool. I loved it from you know the morning I the moment I woke up in the morning to the time I went to sleep, it was football, 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 reading everything, just figuring out the game. So yeah. I got just enough to be able to understand it, you know, playing and like, oh, okay, this is why they do this. This is, uh, you know, just details about the game you get from playing. Uh -huh. And then I got to take that into journalism. So cool. cool. And that yeah. was high school? That was high school. That was my gotcha. senior year of high school. Cool. And then kind of similar to me that i was doing the play-by-play -play for uh water polo at really? apu and uh i played water polo growing up but i didn't know the lingo at all mm -hmm. and i remember the first thing it's like it's a goal it's not a hoop i'm like oh she throws it over the hoop and everyone's like we hired this guy yeah <laughs> little mistakes like that <laughs> but you just gotta push through oh you push through yeah. but it, it is fun dude uh, especially mm -hmm. when you got the, the the earphones on and mm -hmm. you're kind of dialed into the game uh, so that's cool, man. This and is then, kind of a feeling like, man, who let me do this? Yeah. Who decided 100%. to let me do this? All right. And then I was like, why am I doing uh -huh. Like, why did I agree to do this? Mm -hmm. But so how did you get into hoops then? Because it seems like football was more the passion. And mm -hmm. then did you move to Seattle? And you're like, man, I like the culture of basketball more. Yeah, it was just something me and my brother Jonathan connected with, you know, uh, just being away from each other for quite a while. We got separated when I was, it was 2002. Wow. Born in 93, however old, however old that is, you know. So uh, just finding a way to connect was important, and basketball was that way. Just playing at a park, playing one-on-one, -on -one, not good, you know, but just having fun, getting better, just playing to bond and uh, using that way that sports is a lot of times is a way to, you know, do other things, mm -hmm. become comfortable around people again. And uh, so – that's how basketball started, and through that we went to the Jamal Crawford uh, Pro Am at the Rainier Beach Vista Boys and Girls Club, and uh, just you know that was crazy to us. We we're small town kids from Kansas. We never saw NBA players, never saw that kind of basketball. So that's what kind of got me addicted. It was like, oh wow, this is accessible, um, and just the way I got addicted to football, you know, I got addicted to basketball. So. Uh, the people I was around probably influenced it the most. You know, my two friends, Kelly and Chris, were huge Cowboys fans, still are. So that was probably part of it. Cool, man. Mm -hmm. And then talk about that story where you, you're tweeting at Jamal and you you just throw like a little joke out there and then it ends up kind of jump-starting what you've been able to do with your podcast. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, back in the days of Twitter where you just – you know, you just throw stuff out there. <laughs> yeah. You don't have any, I don't know how that many followers anyway, but when you really didn't have any followers. You just, it was different. So yeah. Jamal was tweeting about the uh, crossover tryouts that they were going to have. And I was like, you know, let me just tweet this. I was on the way to a work dinner. Don't even really remember why I decided to tweet it or what motivated it, you know. So he's like, uh, you know, here's come to this place for the tryouts for the crossover. I was like, Jamal, I didn't see anything for the uh, official podcaster tryouts. <laughs> Go to this dinner. Don't really think about it. I'm going down uh, the elevator at the U Village, whip out my phone, and I see Twitter notifications, which was odd, real odd at the time. <laughs> You're like, whoa. Like, whoa, what is this? I've never had that dopamine yeah, hit well, before. Huh, is this blue? Uh, <laughs> and so I see it's Jamal Crawford, and he had quote tweeted my tweet and said, uh, I just figured you would be there and said something about Adidas, which I keep meaning to ask him about. 
I don't know what that was about. Plug, bro. Yeah, but he followed me after that. I was like, oh, my God. This guy who brought the NBA to me, some wow. small-town kid from Kansas, nobody, shouldn't have ever even made it out of there, now gets to interact with, you know, a person I've looked up to. Not even just an NBA player, just a person you've looked up to. Like, oh, my gosh. You know, That's crazy, man. Uh, so through that, we DM back and forth. I kind of wrote him up a proposal of, hey, this is what I want to do with the podcast and the crossover. Uh, and we met at those tryouts afterwards, just me and him in the gym. Uh, listening to that podcast is hilarious. Just because I don't know if you've had those moments where you just completely go white. <laughs> Which is in a good. Is when, good. Did, when did you go white though? Uh, as soon as I don't need to ask a good question, but mainly as soon as you know I was sitting down, plugging the things, uh, the microphones into the Zoom. <laughs> it was amazing that I even made it into those. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> that I didn't mess up and I actually did it all right. Um, but you just kind of go into that zone, like we had talked about off air. I think. Yeah. To uh, just letting your body take over. Uh, letting it do what it kind of knows how to do. Your mind may be freaking out in one way, but there's almost a two mind kind of thing. Yeah. And you just have to kind of channel the one that knows what you're doing, relax, go into it, and eventually you're going to feel comfortable, but fake it till you make it. And uh, it's, yeah. That's so, how Lucky. did the interview go for you? Like, you felt like it went well? Mm-hmm. I feel like for me, it's always going to be an important thing in my life. To someone who doesn't know me, it's probably something totally different. But for me, that is the moment of, wow. I started a podcast pretty much by myself. I had other people that helped me along that were really important, of course. But it's just something I did. You have uh, failures and doubts and uh, especially being nobody. Like, I'm not famous for anything. (laughs) I'm just some random guy. So to start something and to kind of build through that, there's going to be a lot of failure. There's going to be a lot of nothing. Yeah. And I kept going for no reason. A lot of times for no reason (laughs) other than to just do it. That's cool, man. And eventually it meant something. Yeah. So after you linked with Jamal, Mm -hmm. what was the deal with him? Was it just – remember, I think you you talked about you had like exclusive – Yeah, it was – Yeah, like a card or something that did you uh, around? Just the way – the way he treated me was – it was almost suspicious in the way of like, what's going on? (laughs) Am I being pranked in here? Like, they're all treating me really nice. They're allowing me to go in a, you know, part of the pro-am where a lot of people aren't allowed to go and have access to interview people there. He's telling me, you know, anybody that comes here, I'm going to get you five minutes with them, all this stuff. I was like, why? I'm nobody. This doesn't make any (laughs) sense. I'll get to eventually uh, why he did it later, but, um, you know, just him endorsing me. Yeah. Got me a lot of places. That's so cool, dude. All these episodes I've been able to do with all these random people. If I don't know Jamal and I didn't do all those episodes with Jamal, probably doesn't happen. That's so cool, though. Uh, Part of the story that I should tell also, though, is maybe the way that Jamal had known of me. Mm. Uh, A guy named Rashad Powell is a staple at the Pro-Am, staple in the, you know, Renton basketball community, the Seattle basketball community in general. Uh, I reached out to him first before any of this and interviewed him, did a lot of work, you know, prepped as hard as I could, prepped like it was the biggest interview of my life because I think that's a good way to do all your interviews. Uh, And I think he saw that and appreciated that. And I think Jamal also saw that and appreciated that. So that probably went into why he even would follow me and that's apply cool, to me and all that stuff. So shout out to Rashad Powell. <laughs> <laughs> shout out Rashad. So you've yeah. you've had um, over 150 episodes. 140, I think. We're 140, now, something like that. So you've done 140, and what was probably your most successful one? And tr- it doesn't uh-huh. have to be the views, but just mm-hmm. for you, like. I guess besides Jamal, mm-hmm. I mean, maybe yeah. that's not yeah. the most successful one. Yeah. But what I really appreciated when I was talking to you is you understand that it takes time. You understand that the views aren't the only reason why you do it. Mm-hmm. And if you don't love it, like, why are you doing it? Mm-hmm. But also there is so much more that you gain just from than just blowing up as a mm-hmm. podcaster. Right. 
So what would be one thing that you've learned on this journey? Because you've done it for three years now? Mm-hmm. Three years, yeah. So, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of growth that you've been mm-hmm. going through with just that process alone. What mm-hmm. What are some insights that you've gotten from that? Like you say, it teaches you a lot. I would say maybe confidence to just yeah. do your thing, be yourself, put things out there, love the process, be confident in where you're going, even though you might not know how exactly you're going to get there, just showing up. Showing up, showing up, showing up, showing up. Whether the podcast gets views, whether the videos gets likes on Twitter, keep showing up. Yeah. That one day people are going to look back on that and they're going to like it. Like, oh my gosh, we found this old the podcast thing. For you, for me, for everyone who actually likes the process, likes putting the work in. Yeah. Um, just understanding that a success or failure is not the views and the likes it's the honest effort that you put into that whether it's the prep for the questions whether it's the editing for the interviews the editing or you know whatever it may be there's you know just things you learn every step of the way so yeah no i definitely think the confidence thing is big i mean i i remember telling you i was like i've definitely deal with different anxieties of Mm -hmm. probably socially deals and it's like all right, you're sitting down with people you don't really know mm-hmm. and you got to have a conversation. And you, mm-hmm. When you're doing the interview, you got to kind of guide it, especially the people that aren't bouncing back right. ideas. Right. So it's like, I, I, maybe I got the white face, whatever, mm-hmm. and I'm like uh, trying to still, you exactly. still got to show up like you talked about. So exactly. that's, I think that's a great insight um, that maybe people who aren't doing a podcast wouldn't understand mm-hmm. as much, but I think you could apply that to a bunch of different things. Because mm-hmm. on the surface level, it's, podcasting is just two guys talking yeah put it up you know no big deal for all they know this goes right into the computer goes right yeah. to itunes <laughs> yeah they don't know yeah they don't know and that's perfect yeah that's our jobs to make them not know yeah you know what i mean for so. sure for sure and no that's a great point um what what do you think the greatest insight you've gotten from a guest and that you could you could uh, give multiple i, yeah. I put uh, parentheses s mm-hmm. so insights yeah, uh, it's a great question. So I've just had so I know I know many that's tough. people on and so many different experiences from something growing up. I'll allude to it a lot. Being a poor kid from Kansas, really poor at times, really really poor at times, and part of that making me who I am, you know, is to not sound cocky or whatever. Yeah, but. For me, being able to be confident in myself and who I am as a person, stemming through experiences I've had to overcome, whether it be from being poor or the house I was growing up in or the situation, whatever it may be, I feel like that was so important as a young kid to straighten me out, to grow up and all of that. So being around people with money and asking them about how they raise their kids to have the same character you have from growing up in a bad situation. Something that's always interested me. Yeah. Because you don't want to have them go through a bad situation necessarily to have that. But it's Mm. just from my situation, it's interested me. So from that to a guy like Sammy Dowd and the experiences he's gone through and the perspective he has, the forgiveness he has is something that really impressed me. Mm. So that's tough. Yeah. You're a young kid. You're facing that from people that you're supposed to have a lot of trust in. You're supposed to let them, you know, completely run your life. And at some point he had to know, all right, I got to start looking out for myself. Yeah. And that's tough to do as a young kid. So to be able to forgive someone who made you vulnerable at that point in your life, that is so easy to say as words Mm. but to live it and experience it is completely different yeah that's a beautiful answer man and we got to talking a little bit um just about your the meditation that you learned early and so i guess how that you you talked about the two brains earlier as well but you i feel like you learned that at such a young age and it gave you such a different perspective um so as you take in these other insights Mm -hmm. I do think you have a buffer that is unique to you because you have been given a different way of thinking from a young age. Mm -hmm. Um, So go into that a little bit. And um, 
I think it was your father, mm-hmm. your father who, yeah, who exactly. kind of assisted you in that, in that route. Mm-hmm. And so maybe what were his intentions yeah. by doing that? And what did you think you learned from that uh, process growing up? You ever have those thoughts where, what if I was born in a different body? If I was born to different people, I was always really glad that I was born to my parents because mm. despite, you know, experiences we may have had along the way, they're both amazing. They're both it's probably because I'm their son, but they're both so cool in my eyes and just the, the people that they are. And part of that, like the book I gave you, the yeah. the Tao of Pooh, yeah. is a book I was reading at a really young age. And just the more of the way my dad um, kind of parented me and installed things in me uh, was at heart, you know, Buddhist or Taoist or a lot of different, you know, Did he use those terms? Or was it more loosely just that ability to be, like, have equanimity in certain situations? Yeah, it was, I don't think it was necessarily those words, but it was the uh, the core principles. The awareness of it. Exactly, the awareness of it. Uh, just everything about it to a funny sense almost when you go back and read it later. Yeah. When you're more of an adult. You're like, wow, why am I so, what's so similar to this? Why is my mind kind of built like this? Mm. And, uh, so meditation was something that was always around, yeah. not something I did for probably until off and on, you know, maybe a few times as a teenager and then, you know, 20, 26 now. So off and on then, uh, so you would think I would have done more of the meditation part, but there's ways of meditating. I think that I agree. are not always sitting down, which that is a great way to do it too. But there's different ways to tap into that same kind of, I want to say mentality or that same wavelength. That space. That space, that space, that flow. Yeah. uh, Whatever you want to call it. So I had a lot of different ways of naturally tapping into that Uh without really knowing what you're doing. The simplicity you talk about a lot with the Tao of Pooh. Yeah. The things you do without thought. Yeah. You take that for granted really easily, but oh, yeah. those are the type of things that I was luckily instill at a really young age. Because uh, you, he taught that to you or because you read about it? A little bit of both. You and know? when did you start reading about it? I, I think you might have said it, but what age do you think you were reading some Taoist principles? Early. Really? Early. You know, little passages. Come here. Come here. That's he would have, he would have a cigarette on the, sport, on the porch <laughs> in his sandals, in his Birkenstocks. Early before those were popular, you know, <laughs> read this passage, holding the book open, you know, read this passage, pointing one out there, whether it was the Tao of Pooh or the Tao of Willie or uh, Zen mind, beginner's mind, or, it's you know, deep one, bro. Siddhartha or whatever it was that he was reading at the time. He wanted to show us. That's great. And later ask me, well, you know, what'd you guys get out of that? Did you, so did you have a, um, like a religion growing up? Did you did you have a faith in something else, or was it was that kind of like your your space, your tune in? So, two minds, two different parents. You know, my mom was very much into this as well, but her family is from Kansas. That's where my family's from, Northwest Kansas. I don't know if that's the Bible Belt, but it's close <laughs> enough. So there was. I'm trying to count how many times I've went to church, but times we went to church when I was younger, but it was always something that. My mom, I could tell, never really connected with. Mm -hmm. I didn't really connect with. From the youngest age, I was like, hmm. Not to offend any listeners that, you know, may have that faith, but it was just something that didn't click with me. Yeah. A lot of things about it did, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But parts of it, and I don't know if it's respectful or not to go into those those specific things, but part of it was like, ah, I don't know. I don't know if the way this is written mm. clicks with me. Maybe it was the stuff that was already instilled with me, but when I read the Zen and when I read the Taoism, it makes a lot more sense to me at my core. Yeah. Note that word, this makes sense. Your senses, it's actually here, tangible. You know, like you feel that. So I, I think that's that's super unique, dude, like that you you have that awareness. So do you do you still practice that a lot? Like, do you still try to tap into that? Uh-huh. It's a heavy thing, to be honest. Uh, same with therapy, same with other things like that. It's really important to do and really important to 
stay up on your mental health. But for me, a lot of it is taking a break, letting it breathe, letting myself just kind of be free. Yeah. Not worry if I don't, you know, sit down, do a couple head spaces every week. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. And I'm still doing okay. Yeah. You have, you know, have ways to watch yourself, but I have had mental illness in my family. Yeah. I've had experiences that might give you mental illness. So it's important to stay up on that. For sure. As anybody, but I feel like especially for me. So yes and no. The way I unwind my brain and be in that Zen state, that flow state, is podcasting a lot of times, whether it's editing, whether it's right now, whether it's there's a lot of different aspects, driving to the place, uh, thinking when you're not really doing podcast stuff either, but thinking, hmm, well, how can I do this? How can I do that? What yeah. guess should I have? Being creative. Yeah, having an outlet to to work out your mind. Because mm. if not working out in a way, it's probably going to run circles, replay stuff that's happened in the past, remind you of stuff that you may not necessarily want to be reminded of. Right. So for more me... For me, it's important to keep busy, Cool. keep my mind busy. So that was actually one question I wanted to ask you was, um, what is flow to you? But more in the sense of, usually when I'm asked, uh, the guests that I bring on, I'm asking them flow in, a, in a, the space of sport. And not to say that you mm-hmm. can't be tapping into that for you mm-hmm. in sport, but it's more of just that's what they do, mm-hmm. right? Like that's their game. Mm-hmm. That's their their value, I guess that are they would put more value on that than you know playing chess or something or doing a podcast mm-hmm. like you do mm-hmm. um do you, does that feel like game time to you when people are coming over and it's like okay i got this interview it's Absolutely. game time and what is your like um like everyone has those rituals in in basketball games you know they they're shooting a, you know, they got to do their 50 shots before mm-hmm. the game here do this routine to kind of help tap them into that flow mm-hmm. to know it's like, Hey, this is game time. Mm-hmm. Do you have that for you in, in podcasting? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's starts with the prep, which could be a week before getting reading articles, listening to podcasts that that guest had been on, just getting ready, starting that prep early so I can feel comfortable. Cause I'm going to worry. There's going to be something in the back of my head. Like, Hey, you're going to be in there. You're going to forget. <laughs> if you didn't prepare, you're going to get through your questions too early. It's going to be a five-minute podcast. <laughs> They're going to be out. That might happen. Something just kind of egging you on, egging you on, you know. So I prep to make sure that's, that can't, can't happen. I'm going to have yeah. more questions more than likely than I'm even going to ask. Because at that point, I think the the flow of it yeah. is going to be out over. But for me to get ready, it's all of that prep. It's the cleaning the day of. I'm big on cleaning. That unwinds my mind. That gets me in the zone. And it saved me actually because you had the cats. Yeah, there's four if, cats. If, in that if house. you didn't, uh, if you didn't vacuum, I would have been done. I was impressed. <laughs> but then, for some reason, the ritual is: I might be nervous before, my heart might be beating, whatever it may be. But once I say, "Welcome back," it's the Jeremy Mills podcast. I'm there. I'm tapping in to that flow state. I am tapping in to that no mind. I'm tapping in to that Tesla auto drive. <laughs> Kicking my feet back and we're going. What what is it a feeling that you get into or is it your mind like, all right, it's game time? It's a trick for my mind to go gotcha. to that place because the hardest thing is to get yourself to that place. The more you try to force it, the more you try and chill out, be in the moment, just be cool. Yeah. You're not. You're yeah. you're, you're the complete winding. Opposite. You're winding. Yeah. So for me it's that. I don't know why. Uh-huh. But it became that. And I trust myself enough to just go with that. That's cool, man. And it's been okay. For you though, what is that? Cuz I know the feeling of being the host of the podcast and at some point you <laughs> have to question. turn the conversation of, you know, kind of moving it into the podcast yeah. to Yeah. Boom, we're on. Yeah, I haven't. Honestly, that's why I I asked you, and Mm -hmm. because I don't have that yet. Mm -hmm. Even my little thing I said here, it doesn't tune me in. It almost makes me feel like, oh, now we're adding pressure to the podcast. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, now it's starting. Mm -hmm. Now we got to turn it on. Mm -hmm. Versus we just walk in and we're just like chatting it up, and then we go right into it. I think the important thing is commitment. In what way? As the host committing. 
Oh, okay. boom, we're starting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you have to change it a little bit. For me, the reason that's easy or not, or it's a more natural, natural kind of thing. Yeah. Wrestling. I was a huge wrestling fan as a kid. And that is a hundred percent commitment by those guys. Grown men in tights acting crazy in front of an arena full of people. <laughs> they pull it off because that's commitment. They're buying in. And other people are like, wow. Yeah. That gets one person to buy in. That other person buys in because he's buying in a little bit and it yeah. grows and it grows and it grows. So as the host to set that tone and go into the kind of create the space of the podcast. Yeah is fully commitment, mm. not breaking that, you know, getting them comfortable, working them through. And before you know it, they don't want to stop. Yeah. Like, oh, man, I could have kept going forever. Yeah. Whereas at the beginning, you know, a little more tied up, just yep. just like I probably was at the beginning. So yeah. just committing and, and creating the space. You have a lot of things around here that creates the space. Yeah. But the one thing that's going to always tie it together is you. You have the... You have the uh, essential oils. <laughs> yeah. You have the mushroom. <laughs> we you have the, the lights. We got the zen. We got the zen. Yeah. No, and I, you, and I you already do it. It's a natural thing. It's just a demeanor you don't know you give off. I never knew I gave it, gave it off until some guest told me. Oh, you well, definitely you, give it off. Well, you seem to make people comfortable. That's the worst thing I could ever say because I, I don't know that. Right. But other people have said that. So I'm like, okay. That's something I should be at least be aware of and build off of maybe. Yeah, there was – so my – one of my mentors, he studies group flow. Mm -hmm. And he started discussing with me like basketball players like Draymond Green, why they're so valuable. And um, what's the guy for the, the Rockets? P.J. Tucker. P.J. Tucker. Like oh. they're like group facilitators of flow, mm -hmm. which is something I think we both practice now. It's like we're trying to allow people to be in flow. Subtlety. So we see the hot hand and we see uh, like – Oh, he's on to something. Let's let's add to that. Let's add a little a little bit to that fire. Mm -hmm. So I think that's it's a great practice to embody mm -hmm. and to take in because then you're then you can work with everyone. No you can doubt. kind of tap in with anyone, you know? It's a life skill too. For I sure. I love dealing with people. And this podcasting business is a hundred percent dealing with people. Yeah. Subtleties. Making those plays that Draymond Green play makes. Making those plays that Draymond Green makes are amazing and almost you don't notice them because before you know it, that ball's already moved. Yeah. It's gone to Steph Curry. It's gone to somebody, and they're making the play. He's doing the subtle things that don't get credit, mm -hmm. that don't get glory, that a lot of people don't care to do, but he's a basketball player. And I hate when people say that, but he he just – that's what he's there to do. He's a winner, dude. He's there to – he's yeah. not there to, oh, yeah, he made the winning yeah. shot. He's there to grind, make you know, be in the right positions, offense, defense, special teams, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so just doing that, uh, doing things that you don't get noticed for is my favorite thing. Yeah. You know, not asking for a thank you, not asking for credit, just doing things and. That's cool, man. I, that was something that we talked a, a lot about uh, during the podcast, like your intrinsic drive to do it because you love it, um, and I think that's a one of the huge aspects of flow, honestly, because you're not in tied to this external result that, okay, now I'm validated. Now this is, this is good. This mm -hmm. is bad. And, uh, so have you, has that been tough for you on the journey? A part of me for some reason has always, uh, I don't know if you could swear on here or not, but you could swear uh, I'll start it. Shit. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> part of me is just always not giving a fuck what anyone else has thought deep down inside not that i think i'm better than anyone in any way not at all but i'm also not afraid to 100 percent be myself and in ways think i'm doing it right doing it right because that's my experience i'm not saying you're doing your way wrong or anyone else is doing their way wrong but for me this is the way i'm living and i think i'm doing a pretty damn good job of doing it for what i've experienced the place i've been put in everything like that so uh I've always had confidence, I guess. And through that, that gets me through things that don't get likes, things that don't get listens, this, that. Because there's a lot of that. There's a lot of failure that is the gatekeepers, is the uh, just goal gods testing you. Mm. You really want this? You really want this? Okay. Okay. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> we will see. 
and just believing in something and going for it, even though it doesn't make sense to a lot of people. Yeah. Why would I make it? Why? Why would I have gotten even to where I am now, which is, you know, nowhere essentially, but I've accomplished a lot of my goals. Yeah. I've done things that most people thought I would probably never do. I have, doesn't mean anything, but I've phone numbers of a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. I would never have expected that people would never expect. Yeah. Had conversations that I would never expected. So parts of that build your confidence. Like, okay, you are doing the right thing, but then you're going to get tested again. It's like, man, should I keep doing this? Does anyone care? Does anyone listen? Like, oh, but just keep the momentum going. And that, uh, again, keeps the flow. Yeah. Keeps the confidence. And uh, just keep, continues making me believe that, you know, there's a reason to do it. Yeah. The That's reason, awesome, yeah, man. just get better. So um, we talked a little bit about, we talked about the Pacific Northwest culture a little bit, you know, like the, the community that you live in now. Um, what is unique about that for you in terms of why you've wanted to make your show more uh, tied to Pacific Northwest basketball players? Mm -hmm. So I'm sure even though you grew up here, <laughs> Bellevue High School, shout out. <laughs> shout out. You know about the Seattle Freeze. Yeah. Uh, I make friends fairly, not easily, but probably easier than some people. But even through that, it was different. I moved from a small town in Kansas. When you're driving down the road, people have their hands up like this. You drive by somebody, you're putting the finger up. <laughs> I don't know them, but you probably know them. You probably know them by their car, really. Here it's not like that. You walk yeah. by somebody on the street, they look down, they look away, you just say something. Yeah, you immediately, whoa, whoa, you, home, you homeless? Are you trying to, are you crazy? Are you trying to hurt me? Do you want to sell me something? What is it? So... It's just different. Uh, you're not, you're not, of course, around people you grew up with, so people don't know you. It's part of being an adult one, but it's the Seattle freeze a little bit too. Mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm that way now. I'm sure, <laughs> more that way than I was when I moved here. But uh, they weren't like that. First place I went, where it was a small town vibe, people accepted me. Jamal. Sylvester, Trey Simmons, Abdul Gaddy, all these guys, for no reason, treated me really well. Trey Simmons, I was walking to Jamal's uh, Elite 30 camp. I had uh, rode the light rail down there. Jamal had invited me just to go cover, watch it, you know. And I was walking from the light rail station to Rainier Beach High School. I was doing my thing, you know. And I see, I think it was a black car, tinted windows, <laughs> real black. And I see like a hand, kind of like motion he's going to pull over. Why did I think that was for me? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but those things that you don't really know why you're doing when I started the podcast, I don't know really why I'm doing it. Yeah. But you have that feeling that I'm stupid enough to follow, that I'm confident <laughs> enough to follow for whatever reason. So I cross a busy street. I'm like, yeah, yeah, Whatever. Don't know who it is. Run across a busy street and, uh, you know, get across the sidewalk and look in the window to Trey Simmons. I, he's like, get in. I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is crazy. <laughs> like a fan of his before. You know, I'm sitting in the back seat. I'm getting a ride to the Rainier Beach High School with him. That's crazy. And just being accepted like that. Yeah. I was the new guy. I was some random, random guy. But they uh, they treated me well. That's awesome, man. And uh, that wasn't always the case, obviously. So. Did How long did that take for you to get into the the podcasting stuff when you moved to Seattle? A long time. Really? A long time. So main thing when I was leaving Kansas was I was at the radio. You know, I was doing all this stuff, all this play-by-play -play we were talking about earlier. And Jay was leaving the sports director. And there's a college in Colby, the next town over from Goodland High School, or Goodland, uh, and they have a radio program that's connected with the radio place I was at. And so I think partly the idea was maybe I could slide into the sports director job or at least have a shot at doing that and go to school. I'm, I got it made. 
I already got a show. I'm just out of high school. This is great. Why leave? There was a really good reason to leave. Uh, I mentioned, you know, being separated from my brothers. Yeah. And my goal since then being, all right, fix that. Thing that really bugs you, a thing that causes anxiety, depression. When you have a chance to fix that, you don't give a shit about a career. Mm. I would have given the, if I, same situation I would have been doing the podcast back then, would have given it up. Because that's not what's important. You know, mental health, you know, dealing with that's really important. Fixing that first, and then you're probably going to fall into a career later. Yeah. A la the podcast, which I did. So a lot of people were upset that I was leaving uh, and giving up radio, you know either had the money to kind of start going to school or the money to move out here when I chose to move out here. So I gave it up for a long while, focused on reuniting with my brothers, taking that in, learning to be an adult, one, have a job, (laughs) pay rent, be in a city. I was growing up in a small town. Yeah. 4,000 people maybe. So uh, one day it was just time. I had a job where I only worked four days a week. And it was just time. That's awesome. Man. And like I say, when you start a podcast, welcome back. This is the German Mills Podcast. You start it and you commit. You just keep going. And that's what I did from the beginning. So hopefully this doesn't look bad later. <laughs> <laughs> no, man. That's that's freaking awesome. That gave me chills, dude. So, wow. I mean, you made it You made it work. You, and you're going to continue to make it work. Mm-hmm. You got to just, just gonna believe, keep cooking. believe in those those gut decisions, you know? Oh, yeah. You know. Yeah. You usually know. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And the answer is really not too far away. I mm-hmm. think a lot of times we just overlook it. Mm-hmm. We want to find that external fix. But really, it's like, it's right there, man. Mm-hmm. To the do. Dao of poo. There you go. The simplicity. Yeah. You're not the owl. What was it? The owl that's always thinking? Mm-hmm. He's like going through The owl's it. the thinker. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, no, I got Dude, it. Dude, I'm but, so hyped. Yeah. I got in my backpack right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm hyped to go re- like read that tonight. Uh, I'm gonna have to give it back to you later. I'm only like 20 pages Man, in. Man, this is not the last time we're gonna hang <laughs> I know, out. Thank for God the, for the people. Thank God the partnership. <laughs> well, I guess so. To close it out, what was your in the moment? Your deepest. You talked about getting into the moment for the podcast, but also needing kind of clearing your clearing your head and, and maybe you know cleaning your room or mm-hmm. or doing something different, meditating or something like that. What was your peak experience where you were totally in that moment um, and what led up to it? So for athletes, it could be, you know, Jamal could be his best scoring game or uh-huh. like what was his indicator or what did it feel like to be in that moment? Uh-huh. For you, you know, it could be anything, but it could be the podcast. It could be something you've done, you know, growing up, maybe the play-by-play. If, if one thing comes to mind yeah. that you're deeply in flow and in the moment. Mm-hmm. So it's like you say, you have this feeling – yeah, like, man. Should I say this? I'm gonna say it, and it's probably not the expe- answer you're expecting <laughs> to get. But no, that's great. Uh, controlling the noise is something really big. You hear beats. Control the noise. <laughs> it's important. Are you plugging beats right now? Is sponsor. that your sponsor? <laughs> uh, but controlling the noise is big. Anxiety, yeah. depression. Yeah, it's a lot about controlling the noise. Yeah. Uh, I alluded to earlier. You know the tough upbringing, whatever you want to say. A lot of people have tough upbringings, but uh, one situation, we, uh, my uh, step, like not stepdad, but uh, the person my mom was with after my dad never got married or anything, uh, was into drugs, unfortunately, uh, some pretty hard drugs. And uh, we had gone out of, out of town and, they had uh, went to its a uh, – can you feel the mood shift a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> uh, all I remember is it just being kind of like a big tin shack kind of out in the middle of – this is nowhere, Kansas. If you want to feel like nowhere, go to northwest Kansas. It's a great place. I do not want to <laughs> have it come up like that. Uh my mom and I and a couple other kids of his were in the Suburban, parked outside this tin shack for hours. 
four hours. Like four hours? No, like, or f- sorry, four, like, not the number four, but for hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hours and hours and hours until the middle of the night, the door opens, and he gets in. You know, mind you what he was doing in there, obviously. Yeah. I don't even have to say it, but yeah. the gas to the floor. And it's screaming, yelling, I'm going to kill you. You guys lied, this, that, freaking out by this guy. And so he's taking us into the highway saying, I'm going to roll this fucking car. I'm going to kill you. He's, you know, he's swerving. He's going crazy. And in that moment, you had to learn to control the noise. And that was peak make it or break it time when there's somebody in the driver's seat that's not in their right mind and wants to hurt you you have no control what what, what am i going to do jump in the driver's seat that's definitely going to cause a crash i can't jump out what how old are you at this point (laughs) 12 jeez dude so he's doing this luckily he did not crash the car but he's swerving in the highway at the, the peak moment I'm talking about. And I just closed my eyes. And I knew at that moment you just have to just tap into whatever that is. Because I couldn't be in that other place anymore. I needed to be somewhere else. So you just kind of tap into that. And it's a control thing, I don't know. But I was able to quiet the noise. And I was able to control myself and get through that moment of complete fear and panic and you know thinking you're gonna die so the way drugs work is later we pull into a mcdonald's goes through the drive through kind of fast all crazy and then we pull into a motel it's like nothing ever happened so it was almost like your non-reaction allowed him to just kind of i don't know i was this is crazy that I'm comparing it to this, but I was babysitting my cousin after I interviewed with uh-huh. you and his parents uh, left and he's like, no, no, no. And I was like, all right, I can't say anything to this kid to calm mm-hmm. him down. So I'm just going to let him do mm-hmm. his thing. He's going to do his thing. And then he, mm-hmm. and he finally calmed down. Mm-hmm. Was it, was it kind of like that? It's funny you say that because so much of my life uh-huh. as a young man was trying to control the situation and control the mood of a drug addict of someone who that's what drugs are is you're up, you're down, you're up, you're down. And when the down parts come, it's a lot of anger. It's a lot of craziness. So a lot of my life to keep myself safe, to keep myself alive, to keep the situation safe, to keep a roof over my head, to keep food in my mouth was controlling the mood, controlling the situation, not reacting you know, it's almost manipulation in a weird way, but you're you're put in situations and you adapt. So, wow. So you had to learn that mindfulness, like kind of do or mm-hmm. die. I was very lucky <laughs> to have that. You know, you think so? Eight like or you nine think- years before that happened, it was what eight or eight or nine when that initially kind of started going down. But that all those years before that were so important, instilling instilling all of that because if i wouldn't have had that who knows so you were you consciously aware of that were you like man i i'm i need to be present here and not not react or or was it just a skill that you had it was kind of like your flow it was just so have you ever gotten really hurt and uh endorphins kick in you're like whoa that's crazy i didn't know that happened when you got hurt it almost masks the pain in this way there was some sure some sort of reaction maybe it was chemically maybe it was whatever that you know made me do those things but i was almost unconscious of them if that makes any sense it was the two mind things one mind was doing that and the other mind was aware and getting through the everyday tasks yeah but the other mind was you know pushing this direction pushing pushing this direction so do you i mean you seem like a very i mean just the way you speak and Mm -hmm. how you seem like a very calm guy is that is that safe to say? Like, do you feel like that has translated to to now? Like, mm-hmm. when you when oh, you go into God. moments that are way less than what you experienced, mm-hmm. is that a skill that continues to yeah. show its head? Because I I doubt any of those situations are going to be anything like 
I've experienced before and not to be cocky about it at all, but just, it's just the truth. That's, yeah. and so I wasn't always calm. Like I said, it kind of hit a point in that car of, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to be the kid that freaks out and makes this a lot worse and maybe kill, gets everyone killed, whatever you want to say. Yeah. Or are you going to, you're going to grow up or are you going to be calm and I don't know. Wow. Just be cool. That's a, uh, that's and, a crazy story, man. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. No, of course. Yeah, hopefully that's not too heavy or no, didn't no. come off as weird, but No, that's not weird at all. That was that was awesome for the thank you for the vulnerability, dude. Mm-hmm. Anytime. That was cool. Uh yeah. Anything else that you wanted to to tap into or, or to share uh before we close this out? Mm-hmm. Just a shout out to you. I'm glad to connect <laughs> with you. It's yeah, uh man. like you say, not or like I said, not often that you connect with people here. Yeah. Uh, and I think we immediately connected once For we sure. were in person, and especially once we got talking. Uh, you're a unique person. Appreciate it, man. Uh, and think you'll do awesome. I'm honored <laughs> to be on the Flow Station. <laughs> Shout out Flow Station podcast, <laughs> big time. Uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, yeah. Just enjoyed to, uh, enjoying. We're gonna enjoy coming back on. Oh yeah. Breaking other things down, getting more into your story. Yeah, man. Just flowing back and forth. Uh, yeah. Thanks for the platform too. Of course, man. Yeah, and everyone check out Jeremy's podcast, Jeremy Mills podcast. Uh, I, I believe it's on iTunes, Spotify, and, and YouTube yeah. as well. Apple, Spotify, uh, YouTube, Stitcher, some places I didn't put it up on, but it's on there. Check it's it on out Stitcher. there if you want to. I don't know what Stitcher is, but it's on there. Well, yeah, dude, I definitely look forward to tapping into some some more just deeper topics that I feel like we connected on the first time and mm, connected definitely. on more so tonight. So. Appreciate you, brother, and uh, look forward to linking up more so. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Of course. (laughs)